Today we're here to discuss how libraries can become hubs for democracy and it feels like there couldn't be a more appropriate moment to be having this discussion um, in the wake of COVID um, and lockdown across Europe um, after um, the protests that we've seen over Black Lives Matters. There's so much in the air at the moment. What, what role will public libraries have and libraries have in the future um, for developing hubs of democracy. Um, I want to welcome everyone back who has been to our previous um, library thinkings. Um, it's lovely to see you again. And I want to welcome everyone who's new to this style of format and way of engaging. So for you, those of you who haven't been to a tortoise thinking before, um, uh, Tortoise Media is a news publisher. We publish news in an app. We do news very differently to other people. We do slow news, so not competing on fast breaking headlines or social media, but trying to get really underneath stories. The other thing that's different about us is that we do open news. So in all the journalism we're doing, we're opening up the process to bring people into the conversation about the journalism we're doing. We're trying to democratize journalism really. Um, and sometimes we do that with partners around particular subjects like we're doing today on the future of libraries and democracy. Um, so the difference with the thinking is um, that everybody there in this conversation is an active participant. We don't have a old fashioned panel of people to put out their views and then you get five minutes at the end to ask some questions. You are all panelists in a respect and we want to hear from as many of you as possible about your ideas and your hopes and your experience around um, the place of democracy um, within libraries and libraries within democracy. Um, there are two ways you can contribute to the conversation. Um, the first that we would really encourage you to do as much as possible is wave your digital hand at me. So don't literally wave your hand because I can't see you all at the moment. There's so many of you. Um, but there is a function in Zoom where you press on participants. It gives you a little grey button that says um, raise hand. And if you press on that button, you'll see a little blue hand raise up by your name. Someone might want to try that. Whoever's found the gray button, do raise your hand and wave at me um, so everyone else can see. Jane Man Mason has done that and Joran de Boer. Thank you very much. Everybody's got their blue hands shooting up now. So if you want to contribute to the conversation, put your blue hand up and I'll come straight to you as soon as possible. Remember to take your hand down now, otherwise I'm gonna give you a shock and come to you straight away. <laughs> Um, the other way is you can leave your comments and thoughts in the chat and I can see um, a lovely bunch you are everyone saying hello already in the chat from Cyprus in the UK and Portugal so welcome everyone who's already getting stuck into the chat my my colleague Zav is in there and active and he'll help curate the conversation there so um, that's the kind of preamble just to say we are recording um just so you're aware of that um and um i'm going to start by introducing um ilona kish director of public libraries 2030 to to set the context for this conversation and welcome everyone here today as well thanks polly can everyone hear me am i unmuted yeah hi everyone i'm really tempted to just sort of send lots of virtual hugs to so many familiar names um so um, as Polly said, this is the second in a series of three. Um, we were hoping to be able to have met in person in Brussels and that's not been possible. And actually we found um, this process really interesting to be able to engage with you all differently and grow, grow our network a little bit. Um, I want to thank uh, European Cultural Foundation for helping us to put this together and supporting this really glad to see you here as well and um, just really encourage you to not be shy but to jump in um, really have use the chat and really don't hesitate we don't have very long but we want to try and keep the level of conversation high and focused and we'll be in the office um, building on what we what we learn here to carry on um, for the discussions later in the year so have a great chat 
Thank you so much, Ilona. Um, and we're going to start um, by going to Marie Ostergaard, um, the director of Aarhus uh, Public Libraries in Denmark. Um, it's lovely that you're here with us today, Marie. Kick off this conversation for us. Tell us your vis vision for libraries and democracy. All right. Thank you, Polly. And hi, everyone. It's so good to see so many um, well-known, um, not faces, but names on the list. Um, uh, I, what we decided in PL2030 was that we wanted to use this opportunity, as Ilona said, to, to kick off a conversation about some of the big topics, not just in the, in the light of COVID-19, but also in the light of what are we as libraries, which we usually do in our Lighthouse Libraries um, um, meetings. And so what we've been, we've been circling around the topic of democracy and library as democratic hubs in our society for a long time. So we thought it would be a good opportunity to have that conversation with you guys. Also, as, as Polly says, in the light of what we're going through, but, but also on a broader perspective. So I promise to try and, and, and kick this conversation off by a, a short, relatively short um, intro to uh, what are some of the thoughts that we've been having and also what are some of the thoughts that we're having in, in Aarhus at the moment. Okay, and I say Ilona with a hand. Ilona, is that a, no? Just a weird hand in your picture. Okay. I think, I think Elena was clapping. I think. Oh, was that a clap? Well, that's nice. <laughs> there is a clap function, so we're clapping already. That's lovely. Oh, right, right. Um, well, anyway, so what we wanted, what I wanted to try and introduce was the idea of the uh, libraries. We are a public institution, but we also are a town square. And we know from tradition that the town square was a place where, where people meet and discuss and gossip and they share news and they share knowledge. And, and for us, this is really what a library is today uh, in our uh, current society. So we want to try and introduce a topic around the, the library as a democratic infrastructure because libraries are, are in every country in Europe. And in, of course, some have more, some have less, and we have different uh, ways of being a library, but still, it's a, it's a very powerful infrastructure that we have. And when we talk about democracy, I just want to stress from the beginning that we're not, we're not talking about a necessarily political democracy. We're, we're, it has many names. You can call it community activism or civic engagement, but, but democracy is so much more than politics, and it's so much more than voting. Um, so we're talking about public democracy more than political democracy when we're trying to, to have this um, discussion. So when, if you look at democracy, you can, you can translate it, you could say, into, into different things. It's dialogue, it's participation, it's influence, and it's a stimulation on free critical thinking. Uh, and libraries have always been able to... Um, to inhabit horrible, uh, disturbing, inconvenient uh, ideas. And those have, funnily enough, changed over time what we think is inconvenient and disturbing. And, but we've done that in all in the name of enlightenment. Um, and you can say that um, within, um, within this, also we find literature. And, and which is what we've been doing for so many years. So for, the, for us, maybe that's not um, a new thing, but it's maybe new for us to translate literature into a democratic tool. And um, I, I remember I was listening to uh, Maria Vargas Llosa, who said that a society that reads is more difficult to manipulate. So we have an obligation to create good readers. And I think that's not but just because it's literature that it's in the core of what we do, but because it's about this enlightenment that we are, we're seeking and that we're working for as libraries. And when we're looking at um, the, the current situation with COVID-19, you say that, that libraries become this safe space for difficult conversations about life. That's what we should be. So what we've been doing in Aarhus uh, is that we decided to, to name democracy as one of our most important strategic goals for the next two years. And knowing that we've been, um, as many libraries, working with uh, democracy for many years in different formats. We, we've been looking at um, political meetings, uh, debates, all the political democracy, but we've also been looking very hardly on how the different, working with different types of literacy is also a democratic tool in engaging people and making them competent in their own lives. So that can be data literacy or media literacy. Um, so we've been working with that, but we wanna, we wanna try and, 
and reframe the question. We want to try and look at how we can have different types of conversation and how we can create a different language, not just amongst ourselves as libraries, but also in the general community. Um, what is a, a new way of having um, political debates that are not about party uh, parties in, the, in a political system, but it's about being a political person in your community. How do you engage users strongly into the library that you are and the library spaces and the community that you're uh, engaging into? How do you work with our whole um, working with makerspace activities? What, what role does that play in a de democracy discussion? Um, we, 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 shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate the power of libraries as facilitators of public dialogue, um, but we should look at public dialogue as a change agent in itself, and that's where libraries are extremely important. So, so to, because I know we're, we're very short in time, so I don't want to take up all the time, I want the conversation to go on, I just want to, I just want to try and focus on what we need to ask the question of what is the democratic deficit in our communities? And that can be different from country to country, also given the, the political circumstances that we're in and the role that we have or the library legislations. But then the question should be, how might the libraries then be the answer to that democratic deficit that we have in our specific community? Because I think if we do not jump to this uh, opportunity, not many other institutions can or will. And of course, it will look different, but we all need to ask the same question because we as libraries are also extremely dependent on having communities that works and the communities are extremely dependent on having libraries that fulfill that role in their community. So that was the super quick, uh, very fast talking <laughs> wrap up, Polly. Um, that, that was fantastic provocation. So what is the democratic deficit? and how can libraries fill it? I think that is a really brilliant starting place for this conversation. So what is the democratic deficit and how can libraries fill it? Thank you very much for that. And I'd encourage people to wave their hands um, at me um, to respond to that question. But Marie, there was one bit I wanted to come back to you on. That idea, a society that reads is more difficult to manipulate. Is that still true in a digital age? I think it's very much true. And reading is a lot of things. Reading is mm -hmm. reading in many different forms. Reading is really, again, about enlightenment. If you cannot have enlightenment in your society, it's very difficult to also have influence. And it's very difficult to have a dialogue across uh, opinions and across people. Mm -hmm. um, so. So I think it is very true and it doesn't matter if you read digitally or uh, analog or whatever it is you read. read, as long as reading is about becoming smarter and getting more knowledge about the world around you. And you can do that in so many ways. So I didn't, and I, I, I'm sometimes hesitant to bring in the, that quote or the literature quote because it tends to throw us right back into the library as a, a place for literature. And that's really not my point here. Um, but the point is that democracy is so many things, also literature, but it's also the literacy work that we do, the makerspace activities that we do, mm. the debates and the space that we have. Mm, fantastic. Thank you so much. I wonder if we could come to Jane Mason next, um, who has responded to that point um, in the chat. Jane, hi. Thank hi. you so much. Um, can you share the point you were making in the chat with the group? Yeah. Um, so just for the group's sake, I, I mentioned that I feel that um, we still have a role as a public library service in the UK as the impartial presenters of information, be that through fact. The, the format doesn't matter whether it's digital, whether it's in an event or whether it's a, a non-fiction book or, or whatever it is. Um, but our role as, as impartial providers of information seems to have got lost in, in public libraries in the UK, I think, um, in recent years. While we've been sucked up in trying to survive and we mm -hmm. present our, our recreation and our leisure and our a sort of slightly educational type role. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when I was a baby librarian, you know, the, the, the role of the public library as the means by which we presented impartial information for people to form opinions um, was so important in, in the 90s. You know, I mean, now it, it seems to have 
I don't think many many of the public realise that that is part of our role anymore. I think it's we've been depoliticized, you know, because it's too dangerous. Um, uh, it's too dangerous to step on toes. Not that we need to be of a political view, but mm. I don't think our political masters want us to sort of, I don't know, push this whole thing about democracy. Mm. Having said that, we did do a project in Oxfordshire called Find Your Voice, where we worked with, it was a funded project where we worked with young people and arts officers, our arts um, animateurs, if you like, to to show young people the role that libraries can play in getting engaged in society. You know, don't just take it sitting down, have a voice, have your say. And I, I think, it may just be my opinion, but I feel that public libraries in the UK have kind of lost that role, really. I, I'm open to challenge on that. Um, and I would encourage everyone to respond to that point, whether that has changed in recent years. I think I'd come back to you though, Jane, on the same point that's kind of slightly puzzling me here. Um, impartial providers of information, that, that kind of notion was a pre-digital notion. Um, and now there is so much information that's controlled by very impartial yeah. um, gatekeepers. Um, how can you know that, that that to me is one of the big challenges to democracy is the kind of partial information mm. that is circulating in the ecosystem what can libraries do about that it's so big it's yeah. so pervasive i think the thing the thing that we can push as ever we've always done this is we say look we've we've we select these books and we've select these sources of information these online databases these uh, we, we share on our social media from authoritative places mm -hmm. and our role as librarians in in being able to evaluate um, not not screen and not censor but evaluate mm -hmm. um, whether this is a source that can be relied upon for at least well thought out opinion you don't have to agree with it but it has at least been given authority be it a university or that the you know the journalist is is as an authoritative journalist rather than some crackpot our role our role in 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 bringing that to the attention of the public for free choice you know they can choose what they pick off the shelves um, but we it has gone through some form of professional evaluation before it's presented to the public i think is is a role that most most people and i'd say under an age of 50 haven't even got a clue that that's what we do mm. um uh, and and that's how i think that's our our role it is not to make a choice about anything it's not to present people with with an imbalance but where we can is to provide access to authoritative or information about where they can find authoritative opinion Mm, fantastic thank you so much for that um i'd love to come i can see marie's put her hand up to respond so let's go to marie and then to elizabeth runquist who's um also got a raised hand marie, marie did you want to come back on that please? yeah it was just i think what you um uh, you call uh, in light, uh in information is really what i'm talking about about enlightenment because i think what what we've experienced over time is that the the, the, the role of the library as a, a patient um, um, withdrawn uh, information provider is mm. is it I'm actually I'm actually advocating for something more I'm ad advocating for taking that role into new arenas where because enlightenment information comes in so many shapes today and I think to to fulfill the role as a library as a provider of information as a as a uh, uh, an agent in enlightenment people's enlightenment you need to go into different types of arenas and i i'm i, I think we can always question the impartialness of mm -hmm. how we um provide information because um are we really neutral when we set stuff up that's always a, a question that can be interesting mm, really interesting i see bruno Eras is responding on that that question of impartiality versus neutrality and I'd love to come back to Bruno um, when we've got a moment um, uh, where will we go next Elizabeth are you there yes hi there um, thank you and welcome. hi um, we have a big 
project in Sweden. We have government funding for three years. This is the last year of the three for bringing uh, digital competence to the librarians or the staff uh, working at the library. And uh, a lot of the discuss discussion is about source criticism, but uh, we're starting more and more to discuss uh, uh, the trust of sources. You have to 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 talk to the, the to the patrons or the to the users of the library about which sources could you trust. We we have been focusing for a long time to making source criticism, and when it goes unbalanced, mm. every source is. Uh, believed uh, not trustworthy. We have to uh, teach or, or to show which kind of sources you actually could believe in. You don't have to repeat source criticism over and over and over again because mm -hmm. there are sources that is trustworthy and we could point that out, mm -hmm. which may, makes it easier for the users to rely on trustworthy information because we have shown them that you can trust this. So uh, within this competence kit, we talk about the trustworthiness as well as the, the source criticism. Mm. Um, so yeah, that, that point around um, libraries being the trust hub, you know, the um, the reference material and um, and media liter literacy as well. That's a really interesting area. I mean, in that the original question we had was what is the democratic deficit? So we're we're hitting on the idea of um, of the information gap for people being the democratic deficit, and what librarians and libraries what role they can play in filling that gap um, through media literacy through kind of references to trusted materials and sources. If anyone has any other thoughts about the information gap point in democracy um, or about another point around what the democratic deficit is, um, do wave your hand. I'm going to come to Alex Clifton next. Alex has got the blue hand up. Hi, Alex. Um, hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, I think there's, um, in the context of democracy, there's a critical question for us about um, unconscious bias. And I think one of the questions that's most prominent at the moment in our democracies is what role unconscious bias and historical cultural biases have, have played in our editing of our own histories. And I think there's um, an important part of this conversation as we're talking about um, trustworthy information. And I think we need to challenge ourselves about how we define what is trustworthy and how much our own cultural biases and in the context of the current discussion cultural racisms unthinking racisms that i that i operate with i speak for myself not for any of you but how, how can we address those issues because i think we must acknowledge the um the cultural barriers to library services that operate in so many of our communities and um really challenge ourselves on whether we what what our own authority truly is to to make editorial decisions about information and what we mean by by trustworthy i don't i don't mean to present any answers um simply that i think we should challenge ourselves about about that issue about what we mean by trustworthy and how we define that and how much is it really our role to act as the gatekeepers to uh, to trust trustworthy information um or, or not and I, th I think that's where the that that's a critical challenge for us at the moment is is mm. addressing either diversity in our own leadership and management of library spaces by empowering our communities to take control and manage spaces and take control of managing that information themselves or addressing if we're going to say that we are the we are the editors then we need to address diversity within our own leadership mm. because mm. we're a very singular group um at the moment in this sector certainly in the in certainly in my organization we are again i won't speak for any of you that is a really good challenge i'd love to hear other people's views um marie should we come back to you on that point um have you still got your hand up on purpose yeah yeah 
Thank you very much. But I just want to, because I, I wanted to, to, to join in on what Alex is saying. I think it's really relevant. And one of the things that we found in OIS is that working with design thinking, working with engaging users and letting them take over uh, library spaces and activities have been a huge part of enhancing the democratic aspect of who we are as libraries. I, I truly do believe that that we, our role is to create um, could say scenarios where people can come and act out their ideas and thoughts and without being judged but in a safe environment where one of the most important things are that we actually get um, uh, presented to other people's views other people's opinions other people's view on the world without judgment and mm -hmm. and that's a very difficult thing especially for us as libraries because we've had a very um, we, we've been trying to be neutral for many, many years, but I, and I think we need to then focus on creating that framework around other people um, engaging and living out some of their dreams, uh, but in a safe space. Mm. I'd love to know, Marie, when you, when you did that, when you democratised the, I mean, it sounds like democratised the process of curating the library, what did you learn about yourselves? What, what did it reveal about your about unconscious bias or, or, the, or lack of diversity? Well, um, when we started, I think what it revealed was that um, it's quite difficult to, uh, to let go. It's quite mm. difficult to allow other people to take power over the library spaces. Mm. And it's also, it, it demands a lot of different um, nuances in what you believe in. And even though people come and maybe uh, say stuff that you disagree with it doesn't mean that i don't have the right to be in the library uh so it's been it's, it's it's a very interesting journey and we're still on it in figuring out how is there a limit to what we can incorporate into our library spaces and and so what is that and also how do we then maintain the um the, the democratic framework, because you could also have people coming in wanting to share stuff that is totally undemocratic. And is that also okay? Yes, in many ways it is, because that's also an opinion that's out there. And, 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 but we need to create a conversation about it and not let someone advocate it. So mm. that's the, for, for me, the very big difference, but that's what we're trying to dive even further into now. Thank you. And, and I'd love to know whether anyone in, in the conversation feels challenged by that idea as well, by the idea, you know, libraries are you know, trusted because they're libraries and because they're run by librarians, not be, because of the training that the librarians have. Do people find it challenging the idea that you would democratise and open up that process? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, um, I can see Volker Heller has his hand up. Can we come to Volker? Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Perfectly, thank you. What was the point you wanted to raise, Volker? Yeah, there are two points. Uh, the one, the first point is um, about trust. Uh, we mm -hmm. had some, some representative studies in uh, Germany, in uh, the city of Berlin and Hamburg. Um, the question uh, how deep is the trust of the people of the inhabitants of our cities to our libraries and uh, uh, the result was extraordinary about 90 percent uh, of the um, inhabitants who were asked and this was a representative study uh, said that they trust very deeply into the institution library as an institution in which they feel they are not manipulated mm. and uh, they trust in our competence of information, uh, guidance and literacy. What I think is that this trust is a very fragile um, asset. It's mm. very important. It's um, the ground, uh, uh, the base uh, ground for a lot of work we can do in the context of um, a democratic literacy, but it's a very fragile asset. And my question is um, how we can work in a biased way, but not manipulative. And mm -hmm. I haven't found an answer on this question yet. And the second point is um, um, we all try 
to get our users more involved in our work. So we work like a platform and we try to get user to generate content and events um, in uh, our place. But um, who is allowed to use the platform? Is everybody who's got a topic, a passion, something uh, he or she wants to talk about, um, allowed to take over the control of our library, of our, of our space, bring in uh, his or her ideas, or are there any criteria uh, we use to say, okay, you're allowed and you're not allowed. Mm -hmm. And um, if there are some groups or some people, uh, single persons, who bring in their own content and events, and we recognize that they are, they are more in a kind of anti-democratic um, uh, uh, trail, um, or they are nearly they are extremists. How do we moderate them? How can we um, encourage our staff to moderate situations like this? Mm. And still I have no answer on this. this these <laughs> well, are just questions, but I think they are important um, for our goal uh, to st uh, stabilize our democratic systems. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. And hopefully the group here will, will come up with the magic answers you're looking for in the next um, I hope so. minutes. <laughs> um, um, Elizabeth's got her hand up again. So let's go back to Elizabeth. And then after that, I would love to find Bruno Eras, who's made a couple of really interesting points in the in the comments. Um, um, Elizabeth. Yes, uh, coming back to these trustworthy and source criticism, what they found was that when we teach uh, only source criticism, people tend to to distrust all information, mm -hmm. and that leaves them in in a difficult spot because they don't trust any information at all. So that was just a clearance of what I talked about mm -hmm. um, before. But uh, in Sweden we have had uh, several occasions when the library have opened for, for discussions, uh, public discussions like moderated uh, discussions and when one or more of the, the uh, presenters are from anti-democratic uh, parties or uh, groups. And we have had a really tough debate within the libraries about where the borders are, what are you allowed to present on the library stage, when it clearly um, uh, violates the legislation about uh, um, uh, discrimination, for instance. Mm. So we had two public debates where uh, most of the librarians think that the border was crossed. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't have happened, at least not in that way and we we have had that discussion for maybe three or four years now mm. uh, where is the border between uh, the right to have an opinion and uh, being violating um, laws about discrimination and so on mm. so it's difficult to find the balance uh, and also we have some occasions where the library has uh, rented out their um, li library space to uh, um, um, organization and it turns out that they are, are anti-democratic and uh, neo-nazi and so on. So is it right or wrong? to leave your library space to that kind of organization. Mm -hmm. And that was more or less due to bad um, guidance 
from the municipal municipal's um, uh, um, lawyers mm. who didn't prevent these things to happen. Well, thank you very much for that. And I wonder whether we can come to Bruno Erasmus now to pick up on two of those points. Um, so the first one, um, you made a point around impartiality versus neutrality. And I think it's worth just pausing on that for a second um, to kind of tidy up that, that, dis, that, that bit of the conversation. And then I'd love to talk about civic participation as well as kind of trusted information, civic participation. So Bruno. Hello everyone, thank you, Polly. Uh, well, this question about uh, public library impartiality and neutrality, it's a very focused point that we need to look at because sometimes we, we have some mixed feelings between being impartial on uh, giving access to information. It, it's not the same to be neutral. And yesterday I participated in a debate with Portuguese librarians and Latin American colleagues, and there was a lot of confusion between these two con concepts. I understand that it's important to provide access to information in an impartial way, but we have to stand for some kind of values and some kind of thoughts about what is um, defined as being correct and we need to be more active. The yeah. other thought, of course, it was what we are talking even a moment ago, between the role of the librarian. When we, when Marie, uh, quoted the Mario Vargas Llosa uh, quotation about reading. Of course, reading, it's a main topic about libraries. It's very important to use this to read, to have access to books and to think about what they read. But it's not the same when we promote access to literature and just uh, wait that from some magical, strange way, users will be enlightened about uh, uh, trends, topics of the society. We need to help them to be more active and to think and to not lead them in some uh, authoritative way, but to create spaces where people can talk about things, to provide safe spaces uh, where uh, users, where citizens mm. can debate uh, some kind of, of topics. And just a final topic that we can uh, mm live with our after this interesting uh, session about are we as librarians ready to assume this role do we want to be uh, a democratic um, do we want to assume this democratic role or are we more interested between um, this uh, active and proactive um, position or do we want to be information managers or information curator. From my point of view and my experience, um, we have uh, a balance between these two jobs, these two positions, if you want to. And you need to think seriously about what is a library as a democratic, not just a word, but the public library as a real democratic institution. And what is the meaning of this? Thank you so much for that. And. Um, and just briefly, I'd love to come to I I Iona um, Krihana, who is reflecting on that point, I think, and making a warning about some of the, the dangers around democracy as well, or, or around politics. Iona, are you there? It's Krihana, C-R-I-H. Hello. Hello, hi. Hello, uh, everyone. Because it helps my colleague who's trying to find it you. It was a, sh a short note. <laughs> oh, yeah. a short note. Thank uh, you. I, uh, I, yeah, uh, I didn't ante anticipate to, to intervene in this, uh, in this call. Yeah. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, this time the uh, democracy concept is, uh, is, a, is in a huge uh, debate because um, um, one once uh, considered that uh, the principles of democracy uh, are in decline. Mm. And uh, I think that is necessary a debate about uh, uh, the statute of democracy principles uh, nowadays. Mm. Because uh, libraries uh, uh, have the potential to be um, um, hubs of democracy, 
Uh, in fact, in uh, the National Library of Romania, uh, already uh, already exists uh, a kind of uh, democracy hub. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid that uh, it uh, may be more or less uh, difficult to manage uh, the, the activities organized in this uh, space because in Romania politicians are very interested in um, um, in having in their hands uh, the political and uh, the democratic discourse in order to manipulate uh, uh, the the vote mm -hmm. so there's and, some risk there as well Yes, and uh, from this uh, point of, of view, I, I think that uh, uh, we must uh, uh, stay uh, far away of this um, uh, political interest. Mm -hmm. I think that libraries uh, um, are, uh, have the potential to educate the public at large uh, to um, to modulate, to um, uh, to intervene in the education, personal education of the library users, but not uh, uh, to um, to try to uh, influence the public discourse about democracy. Mm. Thank you so much for that contribution and that kind of alternative view. Um, I would love to come to Andre Wilkins next of the European Cultural Foundation. First to say thank you for helping us have this conversation and for um, funding our work together. Um, but to hear your reflections on what, you, what you've been hearing. And then afterwards we'll come to Toivon and Oli. Um, so Andre, welcome. We should be able to hear you. Have you got your mic on? Better? Perfect. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, let, let us know your um, your reflections on the conversation you're hearing. Oh, I, I think it's uh, it's uh, I find it a very uh, rich discussion uh, on um, what could be the role of libraries in in the in the current shaky environment when it comes to the state of democracy. Um, and, um, you know, of course, you are much more the experts than I am, but um, starting from what, um, what you said at the beginning, um, that uh, the libraries are a kind of a town hall uh, um, in, or can be. In, in many aspects, um, maybe a town hall which has been missing. And um, I'm also thinking, um, and I, I also follow the chat, which is also uh, great actually as a, as a resource and uh, how you're using it, um, how uh, the corona crisis is affecting this discussion um, where you basically currently have a relatively closed public space and as we are opening up do we open it up in the same way as it was before or are we opening it up to a new dimension and and there is a possibility there's an opportunity in there and that's uh, what we as the european cultural foundation are currently looking at whether um you know what what are the opportunities presenting themselves out of the corona crisis and how do we move to a new state? We don't want to go back to the state as it was before. It wasn't so beautiful um, in, in, a, in a place that we all have to rush back to how it was. So um, I, I find the libraries are in a, in a very strong and interesting position there. Um, and um, I find the reflection here in this meeting um, great. So um, keep going, <laughs> I would say. Well, um, thank you very much for your, that contribution, um, uh, Andre. And um, Toivonen has got um, uh, his hand up. Um, 
and has talked about a dialogue. Um, I'd love to hear more about these dialogues you're having um, in Finland, um, picking up on Bruno's point about um, creating civic engagement and civic conversation in libraries. Tell us about the dialogues you're having. Oh, hello everyone. This is Finland calling. This is actually <laughs> La city of Lahti calling. Uh, it's so nice to be here today with all of you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, first of all, I want to say that uh, I think that we Finnish people, we are so behind for our lovely neighbors from Sweden, from Sweden, how to actually talk to each other, how to have actually a uh, good dialogue with each other. Mm -hmm. And we have found in our, one of the biggest problems in our democracy is the actual thing that we are not trying to understand other people. The polarization has going so strong, uh, I think not only in Finland, but in all the world, that we are so strictly living in our own bubble, finding this is the reality. I know the facts. I don't want to actually have an understanding dialogue with uh, other people. And in that uh, problem, we have been attacking here in Finland. <laughs> and we have thinking that uh, because Finnish libraries have been in, in many years a place for debate, mm -hmm. a place for political debate. People from different points of view actually trying to convince I'm better than you. <laughs> My point of view is better than you. But the actual solution is that we need to have conversations where we are trying to understand each other. I try to understand why you think that way. Try to understand why you think your uh, scientific uh, papers are more relevant for you than what I have read for me. <laughs> because we are living in a really complex world. <laughs> there mm -hmm. is not only one truth. We have many truths. Mm -hmm. And the actual thing is that we need to have places where we are not trying to convince anyone. We are trying to understand the situations better. We are trying to understand the other people better. And in that way, we have, we also be able to understand ourselves better. And uh, in, we have today heard uh, that the libraries, I feel, uh, for example, here in Finland, they are really like no man's land. It's really easy to any people to come to library have these kind of conversations. And about those dialogues, what I have been writing down in that chat is that in, in this COVID time, our Ministry of Finance, mm -hmm. I, I don't even believe that I'm saying this, but our Ministry of Finance wanted to have constructive dialogues all, all over Finland to find out how people are really feeling these situations. And we have organized these conversations in every two weeks. Uh, and over 1,000 Finnish people have been involved yeah, in these discussions just only to come together, having 90 minutes dialogue, trying to understand how we feel this situation right now. And all this data from these conversations have been straight to our nation's government and also all over the leaders, uh, all over city leaders here in Finland. Like they are, uh, and this is like a totally new way of participation and like a democracy movement, uh, how we can actually really hear how people are feeling in this really strange time. Sorry for this quite long uh, monologue, but uh, I'm just quite excited if you don't see it. Uh, that uh, because I think that really that the issue is that but we listen, need to get I'm, people. I absolutely, share your excitement and uh, um, it's infectious. Um, and I'm definitely going to go and look at what you're doing because Tortoise was kind of set up with very similar kind of ambitions in mind. We wanted to open up people to other people's point of view. Um, we talk about civilized disagreements. All our journalism comes through conversations like this, where we hear lots of different points of view on all manner of subjects. And so we'll definitely have a look at what 
what um what you're doing there because it sounds absolutely brilliant um thank you very much for sharing that um i'm just i i wanted to come to so we talk, we've talked about um about trusted information we've talked about um the space for civic debate and civic engagement and connecting communities and understanding communities as well as as the kind of gaps within democracy Stefano Paris or Paris um, has said very intriguingly in the chat we haven't mentioned the word equity um, so Stefano I would love to hear um, you talk about that word and, and what it means in this conversation about democracy yes I was wondering that uh, libraries as a space for civic and public debate is a place for polite and well-being people you know, but I think I always thought that library, the, the idea of public libraries is strictly uh, linked to the idea that uh, we have to fight uh, against the inequalities mm. that are increasing in, in this time, especially after the, uh, the COVID crisis and the, the, the health emergency. So I think uh, that a democratic uh, library is a space uh, where people who risk uh, uh, to be over the border of the society could, uh, um, could find opportunities to to develop their capabilities. This is the, uh, democracy in libraries for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Take side to vulnerable people, first of all. I think equity is the main business for libraries. Mm. Giving people equal access equal. to information and enabling people to level the playing field in democracy. Yes, not only information, digital skills, for instance, are uh, very important uh, in this time. Mm. Um, and I think it's not a matter of information to provide access to information only. It's not a matter to uh, develop uh, reading experience or reading uh, um, abilities or practices. Mm. Mm. The idea is to, to, to be a, a platform for social and for social skills for people. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for that contribution. Um, it's a, a brilliant contribution. Um, I can see, um, I'm going to come back to Marie before the end of the session, um, but I just wanted to come back to Alex Clifton first, who's got his blue hand up. Um, hi, hi again. Hello again. Um, I just, I was, um, I really loved Stefana's provocation. I think the, um, the, the critical challenge of the democracy, the, the majority, the political majority and the cultural majority will be taking care of themselves and will ensure that their voices are heard. I think the role of um, democratic gatekeepers like those of us in this industry is in some way to um, make sure that the marginalized and minority communities whose voices won't be heard um, are, are given a platform and I think Stefan is quite right to say that I think our first responsibility is to look to provide those resources and, and tools um, that we have for um, marginalized or excluded communities um, whose voices won't get won't get heard as as confidently as and as easily as the, ma the majority um, who are so definitely represented by a democratic system um, will do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll come back to Elizabeth um, uh, just briefly before we go back to Marie for Marie's reflections. Elizabeth. Yeah, um, I want to, to uh, connect to the, to the COVID-19 period of time. Sweden have had almost all their public libraries open during the whole whole um, time of the, the pandemics. So um, uh, we have 290 municipals in Sweden and only 
three of them decided to totally close the library. In all others, the local decision makers uh, thought that the library is so important that they keep it open. Then the, it is uh, varying uh, degree of open, but most libraries have been open like before the COVID-19 uh, period except for for events and programs that are cancelled but uh, you can use the library you can use the computers you can borrow books you can return books you can do almost everything that you usually do because uh, the local decision makers uh, think that the library is so important for all the people in in the community so that tells us something important and most libraries have developed uh, new skills and new new ways of of delivering library services but they have stayed open and i think that's quite strong well thank you so much for that let's go back to marie marie you challenged us to think about what is the democratic deficit and um what should libraries role be in that do you want to kind of reflect on what you've heard here today yeah thank you polly i i, I i'm hearing so many interesting things and my my brain is exploding at the moment but um i i just want to point to one of the um things in the chat that uh, joanna Griana um elaborated on that our library should make a uh, mission into um, educating the public at large in terms of democracy uh, principles without trying to influence users' point of view, which I think is, is, is spot on. That is, and, and that's why I'm always trying to challenge equalizing pol poli political views with democracy, because that's not the same thing. Democracy is about democratic principles, and that is about participation uh, and, and engaging in society. But so we, I think as a as a as a, a field, we could probably in Europe agree that libraries believe in free critical thinking. That's not a neutral point of view. That that's actually a partial point of view, um, and and also that we should not be influenced by specific political viewpoints. That we should not be tools, political tools, but we should provide libraries as a platform for um, a diversity of views. Um, so, so when we talk about educating library users, I think it'd be more um, relevant to talk about allowing users to educate themselves and looking at how can we as libraries um, take that move. And that comes back to some of the stuff that Alex was talking about as well. Um, that is not, we are not educating. They are educating themselves and we are providing the tools. And um, so, so we need to be that place, I think, where, where people want, that people seek in order to become engaged and be ordered, in order to become competent. And that's really what brings us to the, the uh, equity and the equal voice. I, I think equity is really, uh, is a good word, but equal voice is perhaps even more accurate that um, we are also about creating equal voices and, and pro providing a space where people can have an equal voice, um, no matter what kind of color you are or political viewpoint you have, etc. Um, so that will be our challenge when we're engaging into these debate spaces that, I mean, Finland has been doing it for a long time. We've been doing it in Denmark. Uh, Norwegian libraries have it, they have it in their legislation for libraries that they should be a space for debate. And I think that's awesome. That's what we should want to be. And, and Bruno was touching a point, um, the question, do, do, do staff want this? Are we equipped? Are we ready? Do we even want to go down this path? And, and, and Paul, you asked me about our experiences in Aarhus once we started on this journey many years ago. And, and my, my answer to that is yes. We have amazing staff that are, they, they nurture on, they feed on having these um, roles as facilitators and creating different formats that gives that equity and that equal voice to people and expand people's mindset. So I think, yes, but it, it takes practice and it takes a long time to figure out what is the right path in this for you. And that comes back to what I started to ask, what is the democratic deficit in our specific community, which will be different from yours and the next one and the next one, mm -hmm. but then looking into, so how can we, that specific library be um, create an answer to that deficit. 
Marie, thank you so much. It is usually my job at the end of a thinking to summarize the conversation that we've had. But Marie, I think you did that so beautifully, drawing together the different strands of that conversation that I'll, I'll wrap the conversation up now. Um, we will, um, I'm going to go away and reflect on this, this amazing conversation. Um, and we produce a readout of it. So you've got a record of the issues we covered so that you can reflect on and and think about it further and we'll email that out to you all in the next couple of days and we have the next of these conversations next week which i really hope you will all in, uh, join us for i thought that was the most interesting conversation um such brilliant contributions and i've really enjoyed um being with you all this afternoon thank you very much never know what to do at the end of a thinking so we wave um, have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.